Today is uh, Sunday, the 7th of May, 2023. I got a lot done yesterday. I think that after the camera died, um, I went about another three or four hours. Um, <clears throat> really what I wanted to do was finish up all of the plate nuts. Uh, a little disclaimer here, by the way. I'm used to hearing them called nut plates and calling them nut plates, but the plans call them plate nuts and I drive myself crazy if I go back and forth. So I'm just gonna say what the plans say, I'm gonna call them plate nuts. Anyways, what we're looking at here is the uh, one of the two main spars. Uh, this is, not that it's really relevant, but this is the left main spar. This is the inboard and where it, this is where it attaches to the fuselage. And what we're looking at specifically here are all of these nut plates that run along both flanges. These large nut plates, larger than these anyways, these large, large nut plates, uh, plate nuts, oh my God. These large plate nuts are um, for attaching the fuel tanks. There are 30 on the top, 30 on the bottom, so a total between the two wings of 120 plate nuts. Then you see these smaller ones here. This is the bottom side of the spar. On the bottom of the wing, on each wing, there are three access panels um, that are attached with plate nuts. Um, three access panels, each of one of those has four plate nuts, so a total of uh, 24 total between the two wings. 24 plate nuts there. So where does that put us? 144 plate nuts. And then every plate nut, oh wait, there are more. Maybe you can see it over here. These two right here are, this is considered the center section of this bar where it's sort of inside or attached to the airplane. And these two will eventually be attached to vertical um, bars inside of the fuselage assembly. So that's four more. So I think that, whatever, I think it's 148 plate nuts that I did yesterday, but to do 148 plate nuts, you have to do three countersunk holes for every plate nut. So a lot of countersinking, I think uh, 360 for these plus another 48 for the others, let's just call it 400 and change, uh, countersinks. And the countersinks don't go quickly. The, I called Vans uh, technical support before I started doing this countersinking because the, the instructions seem strange to me. The, these small ones, which you probably can't even see, but the ones that are for the uh, 332 rivets that attach the nut plate to the spar, these are pretty straightforward. You're just making a countersink that leaves a 332nd rivet flush with the surface. Um, and you have a, um, a countersink pilot with a number 40 or 332nd pilot, and it's pretty straightforward. These ones though, if you use, it's a number 19 hole, but if you use a number 19 pilot um, to countersink it, you'll take away too much material. So the instructions are to first attach the plate nuts, then use a number 30, which is an eighth inch pilot, a number 30 pilot countersink. And in theory, once you start countersinking this hole, that pilot will center up in the, the throat or the countersink of the plate nut itself. But before that happens, there is unavoidable chatter and an ugly looking hole until you get to a depth where in fact it does do that. Before you do any of this, you do, you, you do this on some test material so you can figure out what that depth is gonna be. And then you just kinda hold your breath when you do your first couple until you figure out the technique. And for me, and I think I took a little video of it, for me the technique was to start very, very slowly with very light pressure to let the countersink start forming a hole where it could, even though the pilot is loose in there, um, and then slowly accelerate, and then there will come a point where it smooths out when it does in fact get to the plate nut for the guide. Um, 
one question that I had that I was concerned about was that the holes are not final size. So they weren't final size for the number eight screw, which is a number, which is a number 19 uh, drill bit. And I didn't want to upsize them um, if I wasn't supposed to, uh, which would mean an even bigger hole with even more chatter until you got through there. And uh, so I experimented with one before making any attempt to upsize them. And what I found out is that when the countersink is set to the proper depth for this particular application, it will kind of knife edge this countersink and actually widen out the bottom of the hole and that screw fits perfectly. That's a long explanation, but I think that it's worthwhile because this is probably the most uh, stressful part of um, wing construction. And it's like one of the first things you do because you're taking metal off of this very expensive spar and you don't want to screw it up. Um, I think that I got all of the plate nuts done. There are three, I can see that there are holes for three plate nuts right here, but so far the plans, I, I don't see where they come into play yet. And I'm gonna follow the sequence of the plans because that's working out for me right now. And the next thing in the sequence of the plans is to go through and spot prime all of these countersinks um, because the, the anodizing has been removed. So just for some extra layer of corrosion resistance because these aren't getting riveted right away. This, these are gonna be used with plate nuts for screws, which means they're gonna come in and out, in and out, in and out. So they need some kind of protection. Um, so I'm just gonna spray a little of uh, the self-etching primer that I've been using into a cup and grab a swab and do all of those. When that's done, the next step in the plans is to start fabricating the tie down assembly and attaching the, um, what do you call it? The bell, the bell crank bracket to the spar. So I'm gonna try to get all of that done today. I don't know that I'll get any further than that, but if I did, that would be awesome because I think next I would actually start building the skeleton, which I'm excited about. Uh, these, um, the larger countersinks for the, the number eight screws for the tank attachments, 30, on each side of the spar and I timed it. It takes took me like 45 or 50 minutes to do 30 countersinks and I had to do that four times. And then of course, yeah, I mean, it was two long, pretty long work days just attaching, just doing the countersinks and attaching the plate nuts. I'm not done countersinking, by the way. Um, the skins all still eventually have to attach <laughs> to this thing. And you can't dimple this bar. You'll really mess it up if you do. So you have to countersink um, all of the remaining holes to accept the dimple. Those shouldn't be that bad. It's a three, th I mean, it's still a slow process, but it's not as scary a process because you actually use um, like these ones right here, you actually use the countersink pilot that fits that hole. So you don't have to worry about chatter. You just have to get the, the depth set correctly for the dimple and then you're good. Anyways, uh, this is a very long intro, but um, it's a new phase of the build and some of the most stressful work um, so far in the build and worth an update, especially because I think if there are other people who are building this or building a seven and they're approaching this step, um, they will approach it with similar trepidation. And so I just wanted to share my experience with it. It all turned out nicely, um, but it nerve wracking the process for sure. I, I think that's unavoidable. Anyways, I'm gonna get ready to spot prime and you're gonna get ready to watch me sit in a chair on a GoPro. So have fun with that. Okay, so uh, spot priming all of the exposed countersinks. Uh, wearing a mask because I sprayed some self-etching primer in that little cup, but here in a moment, um, the fumes will have died down and I get the, uh, don't have to worry about the mask um, at that point. This is pretty uh, boring work, but necessary and came out a little bit sloppy. So I might just mask it off and do it again. So right here, um, we get into fabricating the um, the tie down assembly, which you see here in the plans. 
Uh, specifically, you can see it's made out of a piece of extrusion and then there are a couple of spacers because it's nested uh, in between those two reinforcement bars. Yeah, the spacers uh, are right here, like two by a quarter of an inch or one and a quarter inches, and that's what I'm doing um, over there, which is really boring to watch from over here. Um, but uh, I think in the next video, I kind of air quotes saying that I fabricated this part because the extrusion itself, which is the main piece of that assembly, um, as you receive it now, it's already been cut to length. You have to modify it, but it's cut to length. Uh, so now getting ready to try to get it all fitted. And I tried a bunch of different ways to, to get this clamp down because when the spacers are laying underneath that piece of extrusion, there's not really any tension. Even when you clamp it like this, every time you roll that spar over, because you have to back drill this thing using the spar as a guide, every time you flip it over, those spacers just slide. Um, so what I ended up doing was using a little bit of butyl um, to kind of gum or glue those things in place so that I could simply flip it over and do all of this back drilling. Basically, you the, with a piece of extrusion, you drill one hole um, so you have a way to locate it um, on the spar. Clico that one hole in and then get the rest of it aligned, clamp down, flip it over, and then use the spar as a drill guide to drill out all the rest of the holes. Um, it's kind of slow work and a little bit messy uh, drilling through all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, so it worked out okay with the um, using the butyl to hold it in place, but I did have to remake one of the four spacers, two per spar, um, because when the drilling started, um, I think that it sort of twisted it out of position. And then when the second hole in that one was drilled, it was drilled too close to the edge, if that makes sense. Um, it just came out of position and, um, but it wasn't really too difficult to remake. I will tell you that I didn't, um, put the little, uh, I didn't drill the hole in the middle of the spacer, the, I, whatever size that a hole is like a lightning hole. So, you know, my plane is going to be about three quarters of an ounce heavier than somebody who did uh, drill that out. Uh, and then once that's done, you actually have to, you though, those spacers are, um, what am I trying to say here? The spacers have nut plates on them that, um, will receive bolts from the other side of the spar. Um, so you need to countersink um, where those nut plates are going to be mounted because um, it's the that assembly is not riveted to the spar. It's simply bolted on, and the other side of that assembly is bolted through. The, the top and the bottom of the spar, those bolts go straight through to the tie-down assembly, and then the middle portion where the spacers are, the spacer of the nut bolts, those bolts actually on the opposite side hold on the aileron bell crank assembly which we'll get to in the next video when I install this whole thing. I think the explanation is a little bit confusing. I'll throw the picture back up right here so you can kind of maybe see what I'm talking about. Um, it's not a difficult assembly to build. I think the hardest thing, <laughs> the, the most challenging part for me was simply getting the um, figuring out how to clamp it down in a way that I could, um, that I could get it done, um, without those spacers sliding around. Um, even I think at one point, uh, you might've seen me use two blocks of wood, one or uh, a block of wood kind of turned 90 degrees to run parallel to the direction of the spar, hoping that if I clamp that clamped it down that way it would squeeze the middle of that um, piece of extrusion and, and put some tension on those spacers but didn't work anyways so butyl was the solution so to speak um, this is a pretty small assembly um, but it is a lot of drilling and cutting and all of that so it still was several hours of work to get this done and I kind of joke that it's uh 
kind of sad that I spent so much time doing a pretty satisfying piece of work, honestly, that ultimately is designed to keep my plane chained to the ground. <laughs> I want to, I want to do things that make it fly. Um, but anyways, yeah, it turned out pretty well. Um, like I said, I had to redo one spacer, which wasn't a big deal. Um, in the next day's work, I guess I'll sort of describe it right now. What I'm doing right there is, um, drilling the holes for the nut plates and getting those mounted on. Um, and I've got a little, I think, iPhone video here of the, the finished product once it's uh, put together. Um, yeah, so I think at the end of this day, as far as I got was simply getting that whole thing assembled, basically completely built, but not um, bolted onto the spar, um, least of which was because it still needed to be sort of cleaned up and primed and and finished and that that's work that will take place in the fall on the following day um what else is kind of notable about this i would say it's really not until the next day or further on but you really need to pay close attention to the rivet plan for the spar um there's a lot going on there and uh spend some time if you're not really sure just spend some time head scratching making sure that you understand how all of those pieces ultimately fit together and what the purpose is of different size uh rivets and different types of rivets flush versus universal head because there there are a couple of spots in that rivet plan that'll kind of leave you wondering but uh yeah that'll wrap it up for here thanks for following give us a like and a subscribe and a notifications and all that good stuff and we'll see you in the next one <laughs>